So, I mean, being a part of a tribe, let alone just my own tribe, I think it's really, I find it very, very similar to like when we have the Chilean Independence Day here and everybody goes to the same restaurant. It's just being that part of, part of like a certain community. Um, and I mean, to me, like I've born and raised in Hollywood, so I've always lived either on or near the reservation. And so to me, I think just being part of my tribe, the Seminole tribe of Florida, it's really just being part of my community. Like it comes down to like, I know where everybody's grandma lives. Like I'm on this street, my dad's right here, my sister's here, my other sister's right here. And then my grandma's like across the way. And it's just always been like that in my life. And I think that um, at one point in time, I think everybody used to live like that. Like, I remember my mom talking about where she comes from in Chile, and it's like, she just came from this tiny little village in the deserts, and everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew whose family was who, and that's really what it means to me. But being Seminole compared to any other tribe, um, you know, we take a lot of pride in being the unconquered Seminole tribe of Florida. We never signed a treaty with the U.S. government, and we take a lot of pride in that. Um, so realistically speaking our tribe is derived from the families and the individuals that were able to either escape or avoid the trail of tears altogether and so when we fled down um, coming down south in florida like we really come from like a very small group of people to being about i think we're like a little bit over 4300 members today and we take a lot of pride of that, knowing that we were able to not only resist, but you know, we live on our unceded territory still. And I mean, it may not be the millions of acres that we, you know, knew to be ours way back then, but you know, being able to sit here and say, like, you know, that we have a reservation located in the middle of like Hollywood, this large city where everybody knows, you know, like all the big businesses and things like that. I mean, like we were living here before this was that. And so that is something that we're, we're a very proud group of people. And so to me, that's what being seminal is. And I think, um, especially when I get to speak with my own youth, I kind of try to remind them, like, remember where you came from. Remember what your ancestors did. Like, we are unconquered and you should try to take that mentality and live that through your day-to-day -day life. So within our own tribe, we have our own clan system. There's, um, I'm just going to go around the camp style. So it's bear, panther, bird, wind, otter um big town and snake clan and so um being a matrilineal tribe um our our clans get passed on through our moms and so since my mom is not native i'm not technically a part of the panther clan and so i guess in our way you would say i'm a daughter of the panther clan um and so really what that is is just kind of respecting the boundaries of certain things like you um being a part of a certain clan, you kind of carry a different responsibility and within the tribe itself. Um, I think it's kind of funny because like we were still raised, I guess you could say technically Panther way, like there's certain rules you're supposed to follow, like if there's a passing and things like that. And I mean, so we still grew up in that manner of knowing what we were supposed to do and what we weren't allowed to do. Um, but it's really just respecting those boundaries is what it is. Actually, I guess to take it back even a step further, to receive federal recognition from the U.S. government um, to be considered a federally recognized tribe, there's like certain, um, I guess, check marks you're supposed to get. And one of those things is that you're supposed to uh, quantize your tribal member's blood. And so what that means is when you're born, they literally go, they take your DNA test and they, um, I guess they link you through your lineage and they're like, oh, okay, well, her grandma was full, her dad was half, so she's a quarter, and so on. And so different tribes hold different quantumizations that you're required to have to be a tribal member. And um, yeah, I mean, like, you really get diminished to being like a half blood or a quarter or you're full or whatever it is. And um, we're the only group of people that go through this in the United States. Um, literally, the only other, I guess, groups that go through that are horses and dogs. And so actually for, it was kind of crazy. I remember when I learned for a long time, we were actually under the wildlife department of the government um, because our blood used to get quantumized like that. And so, I mean, I think it just goes to show the history of dehumanization that natives have gone through. Um, unfortunately, it's still something that's present in a lot of tribes. Um, I know that some tribes go through um, lineage as opposed to quantumization where you have to sit there and just prove your family tree 
And I mean, we do that. I mean, like people can do that. Like I can go back generations, but um, yeah, unfortunately it's something that still happens. And so I think that because we have that and it's something that's accepted, um, it's really carried this, this significance of like, oh, well, I'm more native than you are or whatever it is. But it also causes problems that if you're like half Comanche and then like a part Cherokee and a part Seminole, you're required to only choose one tribe to enroll with too. Mm -hmm. a, a historical context. And I think when I, I have to speak with this, especially in other tribal communities, I really try to touch on this because it, it kind of great, creates a nice foundation for the understanding of why we need to be more proactive with it. And so the, the way I kind of started out is always like, you know, back in the day when, you know, we were trying to pretty much escape captivity and genocide and all these different things, we were always in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, you're not sitting there in a state of mind where you're processing emotions and like, you know, breaking down and all these things. Like, I'm sure we had points of that in the past, but generally speaking, when you're in that survival mode, like you, you're just, you're thinking about living, you're thinking about your next meal, about, you know, um, being in a safe place, protecting your family, your community. And so I think because we were in survival mode for so long, we've carried that into like our modern way of living. And um, because of all these different things, our people have become adjusted to suppressing our emotions. And when you suppress your emotions and you have like these, these outbursts of like sadness or anger and all these things, you go and you try to find a different suppressant. And unfortunately that just so happened to be alcohol and drugs and all these other negative things. And so our people are like disproportionately suffering from alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide, um, all these different negative pretty much statistics. And I think it, it literally just goes back to colonization. Like this was pretty much the fate that our people were, um, were forced under because of colonization. And so when you kind of, and so that's where you start getting into the whole, oh, you're your ancestors' wildest dreams. And, you know, it's so like Instagram cliche, but it really is true. You know, our, 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 our ancestors literally fought for us to be here for, to be here today. And so um, I think for me, I try to carry this too, where it's like, if anything, your most important obligation, obligation in this lifetime is to live a full life and to like find your purpose and to live that purpose and you can't do that if you're like dependent on alcohol, you're dependent on drugs and all these things. And it, a, a fighting, um, or what is it, like a tool towards trying to fight that type of lifestyle is maintaining a healthy state of mind. And, you know, we suffer from depression, we suffer from anxiety and all these different mental illnesses. And a lot of the times they kind of go um, unnoticed because we don't understand those things and I mean even outside of the native community we see it so much where there's just not a very good understanding of like what mental health is through a really really severe depression um, like the last few years of high school for instance and I ended up dropping out and all these different things and when I finally went and got help at, with a counselor and I understood what depression was it looks like oh okay like one, I'm not alone in this, but two, I also recognize that this isn't something, like, there's nothing wrong with me, you know, like, it's a chemical imbalance, or, like, and then I started understanding what anxiety was, and all these things, and so, <clears throat> I mean, for me, um, going back to that authenticity, like, I speak so openly about my own journey with mental health, and even now, like, if I disappear for, like, two weeks off of Instagram, like, I'll let people know, like, oh, no, I'm going through it, like, and, you know, it's kind of creating that space of, you know, one, you're not the only one going through it, but also, I mean, just getting people to see the importance of understanding these different things, the historical context behind it, and that <clears throat> we're not suffering at our own hands. Like, unfortunately, these things get passed down generation to generation. And so, um, yeah, you know, like, take that obligation, take that, that step to, like, be bigger and say, like, I don't, I'm going to live a sober life or so on or whatever it is. And so, I mean, especially with the youth, I talk about it. And I mean, it's been, there's been really beautiful points in it. And there's been really, really sad points in it. I mean, I can't tell you how many people that like after speaking with them, they'll message me and they'll just be like, I didn't ever thought like a missing world, for instance, would go through that. And I'm like, 
I'm like, yeah, like you're, I'm still a normal person. I'm still like just a normal person, just like you, you know, this title, this crown and the sash makes me no different. It doesn't, you know, make me an exception to all these different things. And so um, I think really what it is, is trying to one, destigmatize it, normalize the conversations, but also educate our people and not just the youth. I always, if I do have the chance and I have like parents in the room, I'm always like, this is where you come in as parents and you have to have these uncomfortable conversations and it sucks and you're probably not going to hear things that you like. But if your kid is coming to you and telling you like, hey, I think I'm depressed and you're sitting there saying, well, you have a roof over your head, you have clothes, you have food, like you shouldn't be depressed, that, that makes it that much worse. And I was like, we have a suicide epidemic going on in our community. Like we need to be, we need to be proactive and going towards this. And like, there's, we can't sit here and, um, you know, hide in the corner anymore. Like we got to take it on head first and just do what we can because we have to protect our kids. And I mean, I hear, I think a lot of us hear stories all the time of like, um, they would get like our tribal leaders drunk and then have them sign like the treaties and things like that. Um, but it was also something that was introduced into our community. Like it wasn't something that we used to have. Um, but I also think that when we get diminished, just being alcoholics, that just goes to show that there's such a lack of education about our people. Cause it's like, why is it that only our group of people gets to be like just the group of alcoholics? It's like everybody drinks, you know what I mean? And it kind of sucks because um, I've definitely seen a lot of situations and I mean, I can even sit here and say experience myself where it's like, if you do say like, oh yeah, like sometimes I'll go and I'll have a drink like socially with my friends. They're like, oh, so you're an alcoholic. But then if you say, oh, I'm living sober, they're like, oh, so you used to be an alcoholic. And so it's almost like you can't win. And, and so that's where we have to start normalizing the perception of natives just to non-natives. It's like, no, we're normal people. Like we have jobs, we eat breakfast together, we, you know, go to the movies and things like that. And so I think it's really ugly what happens because it's like, I, I hear and I've read so many stories of like even people going into like hospitals to get health care and um, they'll be like, you know, I'm in a lot of pain and they're like, well, we're not going to give you ped means or pain meds because we know how your people are, you know, and so it's so dangerous that this perception is so normalized in our country because it literally affects people's health and things like that. And um, it carries on to all aspects of our life. It's like going into a job and they're like, oh, well, you know, like, are you an alcoholic? And it's like, dude, I'm just here for like a job interview mm -hmm. or, you know, you go in to get healthcare and the same thing. And so we're not just alcoholics. We're not just drug addicts. You know, we are people that, have suffered from the system that other people benefit from. And that is just the reality of it.